Hello, everyone. Welcome to INACOL's March Teacher Talk webinar. My name is Natalie Abel. I'm the Strategic uh, Partnerships Director here at INACOL, and I will be helping to facilitate today's webinar. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I have just a few housekeeping details to go over as some folks continue to trickle in here. So. Um, we are thrilled to have Rachel Mula here with us today. She is our INACOL uh, Teacher of the Year. If you attended our symposium uh, last fall, you would have seen Rachel receive her award for INACOL Teacher of the Year. And she's doing really, really impressive work at East Pennsboro Area Middle School. Um, so we're so excited that she's here with us tonight sharing her time and her expertise and her promising practices in this work. So um, we're very, very thankful for her. So before we get started, I have just a few items to run through with you. So in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a chat box. And I encourage you to please introduce yourself. We'd love to know if you're a teacher, if so, um, where you're teaching and uh, you know whether or not you're implementing personalized learning, just getting started, really advanced. We'd love to learn a little bit more about you. And we'd love to hear your insights and your experiences throughout this webinar, too. Uh, we really want this to be a two-way conversation and a really rich dialogue because we have a ton to learn from Rachel, but we have a ton to learn from you all as well. So. Um, please feel free to also ask questions in the chat box because we'll certainly save some time to address those at the end during Q&A. Um, so we will certainly keep track of those for you. And if you are on social media, feel free to share what you're learning there as well. And um, feel free to tag us at, um, at INACL and tag Rachel and share what you're learning with our peers and colleagues who couldn't be here this evening. So um, we're really looking forward to seeing those conversations happen too. And lastly, tonight, tonight's webinar, um, depending on where you're tuning in from, it might still be afternoon, but um, this webinar will be recorded and archived. Uh, on the inacol.org website. So we'll send you all a follow-up email that will have a link to this full recording as well as the slides that you're going to see tonight. So you are free to um, access this full recording in the future should you need to refer back to these conversations or openly share this content with um, other peers or colleagues who might also be interested. So. You'll have access to all of that. So with that, I am so thrilled to introduce Rachel Mula, a really, really tremendous teacher coming out of Pennsylvania who's going to be talking to us about ways to differentiate and individualize and personalize instruction. So without further ado, Rachel, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Natalie. And I am very grateful for everybody who's here today. And I'm excited to share a little bit about my journey and how I have embraced the philosophies of blended and personalized learning um, and the way that I've just made it work for me in a public school setting. It's certainly not an easy task. And I think that when I started learning some of the ideas and the driving forces behind really moving toward more personalized education, I felt very overwhelmed and a little bit, well, I shouldn't say a little bit, probably a lot restricted to what I actually could do practically in my classroom with all of the different barriers that I had to face being a public school, um, I'm a seventh grade teacher. So my goal for the presentation is just to give other teachers what I thought back then. Um, and that's just practical ideas of ways to integrate some of these ideas into a real classroom right away. So I can say to start without a doubt that since reimagining my instructional approach, I understand my learners better than ever, not just as little people, but 
how they receive and process and retain information. And it honestly has been a process of self-discovery for me, too. Um, so that's where I will start. So I have learned about myself that I am a dreamer with a very vivid imagination that keeps me up at all hours of the night, makes it hard for me to focus. It's difficult for me to stay home and to be still. I'm creative to my core. I draw inspiration from color and lighting and sound and scent. My classroom has to be bright and colorful. I repaint some room in my house every single year. Um, I spend a lot more time than I should creating worksheets that have cool fonts and creative borders and all that sort of thing. And of course, the downside to all of this as a teacher is that nothing is ever quite good enough. One of the words that I think defines me is relentless. I don't know how to settle. And at times, it is my biggest weakness. So that's why I never feel quite finished, not because I'm a perfectionist, but because partway through, I feel that I find a better way to do it, and I'll start over or get distracted or find a different idea on Pinterest, like this um, image that you see here, how to design a poetry unit that doesn't suck. So as I was writing the presentation, of course, I got to a standstill and I'm thinking about where I'm going to go next and immediately there comes this voice of a little bit of self-doubt like um, is what I have to share really all that different? Is it really making that big of a difference? Is it something that um, others who are in similar situations aren't practicing? And what I'm realizing more and more about myself as a teacher, and this all sort of leads back to understanding our learners and how they um, really challenge us to think outside of the box and do things a little bit differently. Um, as I was creating this, I was, you know, having that, that negative self-doubt. Like, it's, I'm, I'm not really self-validating enough about what I am able to contribute. But I'll tell you that I think back to the way that I taught in my traditional classroom. And I think we all do this as we progress and we are lifelong learners ourselves. We think to our early years in the profession and we sort of feel guilty about what our first few years students got from us because we're not as seasoned or as uh, maybe fluent in what we're teaching. We don't have the classroom management skills down as well as we wish we had. And um, in transforming my classroom to a more personalized approach, I certainly was back in that same place. And I'm four years in now and still have these moments where I'm questioning to myself, like, when will it ever be good enough? When will I ever be able to stop feeling like that first year teacher that has so much more left to do and so to have to decide at a certain hour of the night that it's got to just be good enough for tomorrow and move on. Um, and as I consider this more and more, I realize that a big part of this is because the bar has been raised in education, thanks to technology and thanks to some of the people who have really paved the way for others um, trying to, to become more personalized instructors. Um, the potential is there like it never has been before. So the more that I see as I'm out visiting other schools or attending conferences or learning from other really innovative educators, the better I think that I should be doing. And at times, that does manifest itself in a little bit of that negative um, energy. But on the other hand, I think about that in terms of what I want for my students. As I'm training myself to be a better teacher, I'm constantly asking them to do the same sorts of things, to have this relentless desire to learn, to improve, to resist complacency, um, not to give up when things get tough, and not to settle. So as much as sometimes it's a burden, it also is certainly a good characteristic. And one of the qualities that I think really defines great teachers, great learners, and um, 
I think it's just a great place for us to start today. So as you're thinking about the ways that changing instructional practices in your classroom really is feasible in um, whatever subject area you're teaching or whatever age level you're teaching, I think that understanding the way that we all have that, that image of how we process information and make meaning out of things around us is really important. Of course, that's one of the things that will lead to the best uh, options for personalization for our students as well, getting to know them on that level. So my advice from the very beginning is to not wait for it to be perfect. Find little ways here and there, one thing at a time, to be able to transform and make that slow process towards um, really reaching individuals. Um, it never will be perfect, but it's not a reason not to start tomorrow. So I let my mind imagine what would it be like if we taught in a world without barriers. And I've thought about this question a lot. So in my ideal world, classrooms would be wide open, flexible spaces. We wouldn't teach content. We would teach learning skills. Um, there would be no grade levels, and there definitely would be no percentage grades. Students wouldn't be classified as high flyers or struggling learners. Um, we wouldn't have a bell schedule. Teachers wouldn't have that one class right after lunch or last period of the day. And ultimately, it would be fun to learn. I have a three-year-old at home, and he has taken the habit of starting to play school. And he lines up all of his stuffed animals on chairs and um, stands in front of them and says, what are we going to play today? And when I come home from school, he always asks me that question. What are you going to, or what did you play with your students at school today? Because that's how he learns in preschool. And I, I like that sometimes in the approach that I take, there is some play, there is some fun, there is that part where there is a desire to keep learning even when the task is finished. And so I consider that to be ultimately a real achievement in knowing when you're, you're really making an impression on students, when they can feel like what they're doing is fun. So as I came to conceptualize uh, personalization in practice, there were a few attributes of teaching and learning that were a bigger priority for me. Um, and I started to wonder, how can we keep up with our competition? All the things in 21st century life that are probably way more interesting than me standing in front of the class teaching how to identify dangling modifiers. And I believe that uh, one of the keys to that is that learning is social. Um, I learn more through collaboration and networking with other people who are trying to figure things out the same way that I am, way more than I ever did in college. Um, and so that really is one of the ways that I have, have truly transformed my practice and what I feel like I'm able to do for students. Um, this is the definition of personalized learning that I really have taken to heart probably the most. Um, because it's one of those terms in education that I think at times can be overused and maybe even lose a little bit of its meaning. Um, but this definition from Barbara Gray and Kathleen McCloskey identifies the goal as reducing the barriers to learning as well as optimizing the levels of support and challenge to meet the needs of all learners. And so that's what I, that's kind of the framework that I approach all of my lesson planning with to um, do the best that I can to change my approach in order to make learning more accessible to everybody. And sometimes that changes based on student achievement or maybe it's based on what they show me that they would ch like to choose to learn about or the method that they would like to showcase their learning. Um, but ultimately it's varying that idea. So some big ideas, some of the things that I think probably speak to me as a teacher and, and ways that I wanted to really approach my classroom differently. Um, obviously, levering tech, leveraging technology uh, opens so many doors. 
But that also can be a little bit of an obstacle in some cases. Um, I've certainly faced some pushback from students, from community members, about the idea that by utilizing online instruction that I'm turning my classroom into cyber school, which is um, not the case because in a, a public school setting, I don't have the option of, of totally changing everything. But at the same time, I really have embraced the way that technology informs my instruction and allows me to meet students where they really are. Um, I mentioned the idea of harnessing rather than fighting the social tendency, especially um, in the middle school where I teach. And that has been the biggest transformation. Um, I used to think that students were paying attention if they were sitting in rows with their eyes on me and their mouths closed and I was doing a lot of the talking and they would nod along or raise their hand when they had something that they wanted to add or um, to answer a question. And I've really changed my understanding of that. And I think that just like we learn better um, as we collaborate with each other, the students learn better when they're able to talk through things and help each other as well. Um, one of the other key details for me has been teaching students how to form habits of success, um, how to really tap into some of the things that I know make them successful across all curriculums. Um, and those are things that I never would have intentionally taught before. So that's been one of the big transformations for me. I certainly value depth of learning over breadth of covering the curriculum. And especially because of the power of technology and the ability for students to continuously work for improvement, um, I certainly emphasize process over product. All of this really has helped for me to harness the, the motivation and the potential in students. So those were just some of the starting points, the goals that I had set for myself as I was kind of reimagining the direction of my classroom. So if I had to put a label on how personalization works for me, this would be it. Um, it's a blended workshop model that essentially cycles through a pattern at different levels of rigor and support and pace and priority. So it begins um, online with direct instruction delivered in video format. Um, attributes have worked really well to engaged students are things like having a live teacher on the screen and um, having interactive ways for students to do checks for understanding or things where they can really um, not just read to themselves and then give me um, data that is maybe indicative of their comprehension level, but really more uh, in-depth for that, so a little bit more um, rigor and things like that. Um, so after that, some of the uh, foundation knowledge has been built, and then students move to the application stage. And this is in my face-to-face -face classroom. So this may have any number of forms. Um, ultimately, the purpose is to collect data, and that um, data will then drive what I do with them in small groups. It will dictate the way that I sort of use a toolbox of strategies to teach students what they're ready for next. And this is something that I think, um, we think of workshop model as an English teacher, that's something that isn't that new. But harnessing the blended aspect of it has really given it a little bit more power. And I've also seen teachers really integrate this idea, this philosophy across all curriculum areas. So when data is collected, and in, in this case for me, it's, it's almost daily, um, it shows what kids were able to learn without me. Um, it's not rocket science, but they don't really need me to define terms and provide basic examples. So when I see what they were able to do uh, without me, suddenly my role manifests. And that's in the small group conferences, the interactions that I have with them when I group them, um, depending on what the topic is, it might be to deliver mini lessons or remediation, reinforcement, possibly feedback on something that they've written or a step in a project that they're on. I'll give them comments about their thoroughness, 
will work together to set goals. Um, I provide them guidance. Sometimes this is like one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's collaborative. Sometimes it's grouped by ability levels or personality or interest or progress or learning style. There's just an inevitable number of factors that could go into that. But by using the small groups, I'm really able to get to know where kids are, um, where they need a little bit of intervention, and where they're really ready to move on and to have the next challenge. So ultimately, the cycle continues to the most important stage, and that is, in some cases, revision. Um, and it doesn't apply just to writing. It might be error analysis of a math problem, um, editing a goal for a project, reinforcement of a scientific concept, but this really is where mastery occurs because only through that combination of the digital instruction, the productive struggle of the students trying to figure things out rather than just memorizing or uh, reiterating what they have been told. Um, but shouldn't they get this chance to learn from their mistakes and from my responses to what they need? So it certainly blends then with the, the guiding facilitator role of the teacher. So I, I never was able to do this effectively um, in a traditional classroom. Maybe I had some visions of things like this, but it became a little bit overwhelming without really having that blended aspect of it as well. So harnessing the digital curriculum has certainly made it more feasible. Um, so here are just some examples, and I I apologize because I had created these slides in um, the Google Slides program, and some of these had different um, and like animations to have certain parts of it enter. So I had on this slide um, some of the components of the online instruction that I use and value, and I'll just go through them in case you're trying to figure out how you can um, either create your own or identify a digital curriculum that might work well for you. So as I mentioned, I, I need my students almost all the time to have video instruction that is interactive. I found that that is a lot more um, prone to keep their engagement, but also help them to really retain and understand the information when they can see a teacher on the screen and even see the way that the teacher interacts with certain things on the screen as well. So um, online curriculum that really is customizable and I'd say progressively rigorous is what has, has been most successful in my classroom. I mentioned the application stage. So I'll talk a little bit more to that. Um, I feel like some of the, the aspects of this are things that people probably do to a certain extent every single day. So um, having sort of checkpoints and whether that is uh, a quiz, an informal formative assessment, um, it could be something that's completed collaboratively. I use a lot of, I won't necessarily call them stations um, because I don't necessarily have students rotate through all of them. Um, but instead, based on needs, I'll have certain areas where uh, in the classroom or certain, maybe even digital areas where they can go to learn a little bit more about what they're ready for next. And I definitely um, try all the time to offer choices about whether they prefer to do things digitally or um, analog on paper and pencil. I think some students still prefer that option at times. Um, so when I look at data, I'm able to then see right away which students are struggling. Um, I can look at Braden, who on the fourth lesson has a 50%, and that tells me that he has some issues with that topic and, and the concept that's covered throughout that. Um, by meeting with him or grouping him with Justin at the bottom of the screen, I can try to identify what specific misunderstandings they have. And ultimately, through remediation or through talking together through that, allow them another um, opportunity to prove their, their understanding. So I mentioned some of the ways that I, I utilize the small group setting time. And this is just the, the real power behind this. I used to stand in front of 30, 35 kids at one time. and. Um, when I would ask a question and one would answer and that one was right, we would move on. And there were probably 29 others who weren't sure 
um, that they really understood what had just happened. But through collecting data and all students answering all questions all the time and then having these small group moments with the teacher, um, there's just no hiding anymore. There's no um, kind of just going with the flow and letting others do the work for them. So these are just some of the, the techniques that can be used in, in groups as, I mean, really individuals if necessary, if they don't really necessarily fit into a group, but otherwise in order to really just align their learning and give meaning to what they're working on. Um, and then I mentioned the revision and extension part. And for me, this is just what really makes everything full circle. So by using an online curriculum, I then allow and expect students to retake the checkpoint assessments that they originally um, took to, to gather data. And the goal is that really after the combination of the online instruction and the time with the teacher, that in each of those skills they should be able to reach mastery. Um, and many of them do. There are some who tend to, I'll say, forget to complete the cycle, that they've, they've gotten a good enough score and they don't necessarily um, go back to those checkpoint assessments. But in encouraging this, it really values and emphasizes their growth rather than just that achievement. So it's not just a, a test or a quiz. It's something that is a fluid number that indicates truer understanding than um, a percentage grade. So here's where it gets a little bit more practical. Um, I'm going to share what I've realized, and many times that's been based just on tri trial and error. Um, these are the things I would tell my more inexperienced self if I had to do it all over again. So one of the, the greatest realizations I've had is um, that student engagement is the single most important factor for success. So in a traditional classroom, I would stand in front of my students and I thought I was very clever in the way that I could lecture or give information, model um, different things that we were doing. But the truth is that in many cases, I was teaching to the middle and hoping that the students who were achieving below grade level would get something out of what I was saying um, and be able to remember it long enough for me to assess it. Um, and also that my higher achievers, who really didn't need all of my modeling and for me to talk through everything, um, that I wouldn't lose them. So one of the, the biggest things that has changed about my approach to lesson planning or to any sort of unit plan is trying every chance I can to change the old approach of the worksheet and the packet or the multiple choice question into something that gets kids talking and moving and keeping their hands busy, um, at times hopefully taking a break from technology. Um, because it really is a balance of all of that that, that truly makes their learning successful and it's only when they're engaged that we really are able to personalize because otherwise it's very difficult to tell whether they're showing us their true abilities or whether they're being hindered by their lack of focus or attention or motivation or any other thing. So with everything that I do and plan, I think if I had done this before on paper, how can I change that? So it's sometimes so much simpler than we make it out to be. Um, you can see a picture here of students who are reading and analyzing a poem that I just put up on the wall instead of on a worksheet. So it got them up out of their seats and they had to go talk about it and there were certain things that they needed to point out to each other and there was conversation going on. Um, I've done lots of activities that I wouldn't have taken the time to do in the past because I spent so much time lecturing and I felt like I had so much instruction that I had to deliver. Now I realize that a lot of the learning can take place among the students. Um, for example, at the beginning of every year I tend to do a lot of review of terms related to my subject area. So for example, we'll go through plot structure and I'll re-explain to students as a refresher what the exposition and the conflict and the rising action um, was. 
And at the beginning of this year, I thought, I know for a fact that not everybody needs me to do that. So it's kind of a waste of time for me to stand in front of everybody and teach that explicitly. How could I make this more engaging? So I just took the same worksheet that I would have done before. I cut it up into a bunch of little pieces. I put the kids in groups and gave all of the pieces to them. And they glued the pieces of the plot to the graphic organizer. And in every single class, every single group was able to figure it out accurately. So I thought to myself, that process took maybe 10 minutes. Um, I would have spent almost a whole class period reviewing it and giving examples and modeling. Um, there were certainly students in my classes who needed their peers to explain things to them and to kind of take a leadership role and refresh their memories. But I didn't have to be the one to do that. And in changing the attention of the kids from being focused on me at the front of the classroom to focused on each other all throughout the classroom, the conversations that I heard really blew me away. So the students who remembered the terminology from previous years were able to use that very eloquently to explain to the others what they maybe had forgotten or not understood. Um, I use a lot of techniques like literature circle discussions, defined uh, roles within a group um, so that it's really clear what students are expected to do. And that has really changed the dynamic of my classroom. So if you had walked past my classroom five years ago, it would have been fairly quiet and orderly. And now there is just a buzz going on all the time. There are kids talking. And I teach them exactly how to monitor their focus so that they're talking about the right things and using the right kind of language and, and continuing to question and think and all of that. Um, certainly with my support and my guidance, but not necessarily by me driving all of the conversation all the time. Um, this is a just a great depiction, I think, again, from Bray and McCloskey from their um, book, How to Personalize Learning. This is sort of a continuum of engagement. And I think that this really illustrates pretty well how we can change from being more teacher-centered to learner-centered and hopefully eventually learner-driven. So there's the little compliant student down at the bottom that follows directions really well and raises her hand and, and makes eye contact and shows all of those sort of signs that she's paying attention. But as relationships are built with the teacher in those small groups and that, that time where the teacher is really taking time to speak um, directly to that student based on, on their needs and a level that they can understand and connect with. There's really that commitment. And then eventually, the connection grows. And there is the ability to then apply inquiry to discovery and exploring new ideas. And this is where we really hook them. This is where they, they come to school and say, I, I finished what I was working on and I couldn't stop because I just was so interested in this. Or I know I wasn't supposed to go past chapter 15, but I finished the book last night because I couldn't put it down. Um, when students feel more in control, they have a little bit more responsibility for their learning. And that intrinsic motivation really just helps that engagement piece to, to really flourish. And I've just found that creating learning experiences is so much more effective for students than just exposing them to my lessons. Um, I always think we didn't learn how to teach in college. We learned through our student teaching in those early days of just trying to experiment and figure it out, um, being immersed in it. And we still are learning every single day. I recently just showed my students part of the documentary of Mrs. Elliott and her class divided experiment, where uh, just after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, she created a, a situation of discrimination in her classroom. And based on students' eye color, the uh, certain students had privileges and others had restrictions. And as the documentary unfolds, you see the second day, the roles reverse. And the genuine um, reactions of the students to how awful it feels to be the one that is inferior to the others was a moment for me when I saw that film years ago. And I thought, wow, that is an experience 
experience. Those kids will always remember that moment because the teacher showed them what it felt like. She didn't just tell them. She didn't just show them. She created an experience that really allowed them to live it. And I think that that's a great lesson um, for all of us when we're thinking about the students who question, why do I have to know this? And we all know in our hearts that there are things that we teach that they are going to use um, throughout the rest of their lives. But instead of trying to explain that to them, I think creating experiences where we really can show that to them is the most powerful thing that we can do. So another realization that I had um, was that all students need and deserve to be taught executive functioning habits. The first year that I utilized a blended approach, um, students on my team in seventh grade um, had a sort of like a flex lab rotation model where 50% of their core content course time was digital content and they would access that in a learning lab. And that first year, I sort of dove right in and I made a lot of assumptions about students that I realized are a little bit asinine. <laughs> so there are certain things that we all assume kids know how to do without necessarily explicitly teaching those things to them. Um, and I'm going to skip one slide here just to show you a list of some of the things that the assumptions that I made, that students know how to keep their things organized. Here's a big one. They know how to read a rubric. I would hand out rubrics all the time. It's one of my favorite ways to be able to personalize, um, especially when it draws the attention more toward their growth and progress than it does toward a uh, percentage score. But I assumed they knew how to read a rubric, and I realized after uh, nagging them to look at the rubric and why didn't they look at the rubric before they submitted their project. I realized nobody had ever taught them how to do that. Um, you know, we create interventions for students with diagnosed learning disabilities and, and we create um, scaffolds for them to learn how to manage their time or regulate their focus or um, sometimes we'll even give them, you know, different versions of notes. To, to guide their understanding. And I just have realized that all kids need this. Everybody needs to be taught how to be good managers of their time, how to recognize when they're off task and have that voice inside their heads that, that helps them to make the decision that they need to get back to what they're focusing on. Um, you know, assuming that students have worked with partners or in a group before doesn't necessarily mean that they understand how to um, disagree effectively, how to learn from each other instead of just dividing work to get it done faster. Um, I think the same goes for working independently, studying for a test, taking notes, all of these things. And I'll be honest, for years, I would penalize students for not being able to do these things without actually teaching them to do it. So how often do we take points off when students hand things in late, and yet we don't necessarily offer remediation for them not having that skill? So in recognizing this and realizing that all kids really should be taught these, uh, these functions, I've really taken time um, in my class to tap into this and to, to model for them, to reinforce to offer remediation, sometimes that's even in the form of, you know, a, a buddy in class, an accountability partner, something like that. Um, you know, teaching a lesson about how to study. It's, it's not anything that we necessarily naturally think to do, at least I didn't, but it has really made a huge difference for my students. And so ultimately then, here are some of the great byproducts of all of that. These are some of the most important habits of success that make everything else possible. Um, and when we model and teach these things, these are what are really going to make our students um, productive citizens and just people that can go on and really make something out of themselves. So if we, if we take the time to address these and, and explain to students not only what these terms mean, but create situations where they're really in tune with them, um, I think they're going to be a little bit more responsible with their learning.
Um, so another thing that I mentioned earlier was valuing now growth over, uh, I'll say, achievement or a final product. Um, I see growth in every single student, and this is how I measure their true success. So one of the biggest changes for me um, as a state-tested subject is I used to have the philosophy that all students would take uh, the grade level exam, and so they needed to be exposed to that grade level text and that grade level writing rubrics because that's how they were ultimately going to be assessed. And I'm embarrassed to admit that at this point because I really don't care about that anymore. Um, I believe more in my obligation to serve every student to help them to grow from wherever they come to me starting. Um, and I don't necessarily feel that, that need to just say, well, we're going to read a certain Lexile level because that's the grade that you're in. Um, I go to extensive means to collect information about their real reading abilities. Um, we set goals together as far as their benchmark measures. We talk about that. It's not just something that they see a score on their screen and they don't really have any, um, any sort of bar to measure that to. We talk about that. We reflect on it. Uh, we set goals for the future. Um, I emphasize independent reading and choice novels. Um, until I feel like until I'm blue in the face because I just believe that the quantity that I can get kids to read is so much more important than the Lexile level. Um, so I give lots of choices about that and I'll set goals for them individually, not necessarily that the whole class has to choose a book that's, you know, 200 pages long. Um, that's out the window. There's no necessarily every kid in here has to read a certain number of books. It's now based on their, their individual needs and, and really driven by um, that desire to engage them in something that they can access and draw meaning from. I think this is something that no matter what curriculum you teach, um, you really can, can harness because we, we definitely have pressures on us um, for public school teachers to cover a curriculum and to get through everything. And I've just sort of bucked the system for that a little bit and, and made it very clear that that's not my priority as a teacher. And I truly believe that when I am really, really certain that students understand um, the basic assessment anchors or the basic standards that I emphasize, I know that when push comes to shove, they take those, uh, those state tests. Those questions they're going to get right for sure because we spent so much time really uncovering mastery and really making sure that they absorb that. So apply that to a math class. I mean, we so often move kids on because it's time to start the next unit and we have to finish it before the end of the year and this is what the grade level dictates and I just don't believe in that anymore because we see time and time again kids who move on to the next skill or topic um, without really having a solid foundational understanding and the gaps just continue to grow more and more significantly. So um, seeing that, that individual growth really shifted my, uh, my mind frame. So when it comes to lesson planning, um, the way that I prepare units is totally different than I ever did before. Um, I do not ever have a daily lesson plan. Um, what I try to do is think about a certain set of standards, a certain set of skills, really. English is very skill-based, so it's not necessarily tied to any particular stories or, or novels or things like that um, in most cases. But instead, I'll think, okay, these are the skills that I want students to be able to prove to me that they are able to do and I'll create experiences for them. Um, learning progressions, sometimes they're called playlists. I've heard that a lot. Um, I've begun to use hyperdocs quite a bit, so linking a whole bunch of different information just into a Google Doc that kids can use kind of like a checklist or almost like we used to do web quests um, where they have a series of of activities that they can work through. And those can be 
super customized, so based on what students really need, um, sometimes based on their choice of what articles they're going to read or, or whatever else. They have certain activities that they can work through with that. Um, but my lesson planning really is, it's kind of a whole unit. Um, we used to do student learning maps in my district years ago. And I think that this is kind of more along the lines of what I will do. So I'll have specific skills that I want students to master. I'll brainstorm options of ways that they can show their mastery of that. Um, I'll give multiple exposures to the information. So I always have the digital curriculum be a part of it. But for any students who might need to hear the information explained in a different way, I might find um, different opportunities for that. And I sort of just call this my little toolbox that I have prepared at the beginning of, of a new unit. And as students are walking into my classroom, or as I'm looking at data, the class period before they come to me, I sort of game plan in my mind which students fit together, um, what you know, the next progression of the skill for them or how they might be able to apply the current skill that they're studying to an overarching project or some sort of experiential learning activity. Um, so this is probably the most challenging part because it's conceptualizing everything in a way that is very abstract. Um, but a lot of these components are based on things that I have always done. So it's not necessarily reinventing the wheel. So for example, if students are learning about indirect characterization, I mean, I've taught that in a variety of different ways in the past. I probably already have in my, my school computer um, multiple versions of materials that I would use during my lectures or during um, assessments or questions on quizzes or whatever else. And so I'll use those things as sort of my starting point and maybe find opportunities to make them more interactive and self-paced to a certain extent so that students can look through those materials or maybe complete an activity where they're matching terms to definitions or examples or things like that. And that's what um, the class does in my face-to-face -face class time when I'm not meeting with them within the teacher-led small group. So there's lots of learning happening in a bunch of different fashions, and a lot of it is is based on their choices about what activities they prefer to do, but it's not necessarily starting with a blank slate. There's a lot of using what we've already done and know works. We just kind of, I just sort of changed that um, a little bit to make it applicable. So uh, here's another slide that I wish um, would show a little bit better. It's based on um, a TED Talk that I highly recommend. If you've never heard, um, it's by Todd Rose. And the TED Talk, I believe, is called The Myth of Average. And basically, he tells the story of the Air Force back in 1952 um, when they were concerned about the effectiveness of their fighter jets. And they thought they had the best equipment in the world, and they were not getting the kinds of results that they um, had expected. And they blamed all kinds of things. They blamed the pilot. They blamed the technology. They came up with um, reasons why some of the, the philosophies didn't quite work. They blamed the flight instructor, instructors. Um, because ultimately, what good is the best technology in the world if you can't reach those critical instruments when you need them the most? What they realized was that the cockpits were designed for the average flight pilot. Um, and when they looked at 10 different dimensions of those pilots, they, I think they studied close to four or 5,000 pilots, none of them fit that average criteria in all 10 dimensions. There was no such thing as an average pilot. And so he makes the point that this cockpit that was designed for average was actually designed for nobody. And that was a moment for me where I thought, my lessons that I designed for average students were designed for nobody because our students are not 
fitting into necessarily the categories of average that we think that they should. Just because they're 14 years old and they're in grade 8 with similar aged peers and they sit in the seat for a certain number of hours a day does not mean that they can access information in the same way. Um, so that for me was a huge light bulb moment. The idea of a jagged learning profile that shows student abilities and talents and struggles and learning processes all in different ranges. Um, and those are things that we can't necessarily just see through test scores or through looking at kids. Um, it's only through really getting to know them on a thorough and in-depth personal level. So um, ultimately, average doesn't exist. And in creating in my classroom a more um, individually tailored approach to the curriculum, I've learned that what works is often that idea of small groups is effective. But ultimately, there will always be students who don't fit into any of the groups that we designate. And so having a plan for the outliers is really what becomes the best fit then for the class as a whole. So if I maybe create um, small group instruction for students who are, let's say, below grade level, on grade level, and above grade level in a certain reading skill, I've got many of them covered. But if I think about the one who maybe um, can demonstrate mastery beautifully through a creative writing project, um, very opposed to um, one of the more traditional ways that I would assess, like a test. Um, if I create opportunities for that student to be able to show mastery, then all of the others who've sort of been under that guise of average in the past, that particular skill and talent is going to be emphasized. And they have the choice then to tap into that. And that's the potential that was unmet in my classroom for such a long time. So that was one of, of the big realizations for me. Um, my last one is realizing that I need to forgive myself for never being good enough. Um, I think back to why I became a teacher to begin with. And it's because I wanted to be important. And I wanted to use my imagination and to give kids access to their own imaginations themselves. And that's how I think of learning. When I go back to, to what I shared at the beginning and I've discovered um, about myself, I, I think that all of the things about myself, the intricacies that I've learned have really um, helped me as a teacher to know that there is such a vast variety with our kids as well. And when I think of all of the different options that we really can provide to kids um, as far as ways that they can access and showcase learning, um, I think ultimately we really are, you know, continually having that, that mission of progress, of growth and improvement. And um, so the same, the same characteristics that we want, that relentless spirit as a teacher, um, we want that in our kids as well. Here's just a few more things I wanted to share. Um, so personally, I um, have interpreted all of the different ideas uh, that define differentiation and individualization and personalization. And I really see it all as a continuum. Um, years ago, there was a huge push to differentiate instruction, um, but without technology, it was so overwhelming to collect data and really determine any learning pathways. So I would say that now, on a daily basis, I tend to live somewhere around the differentiated and individualized uh, sections of this continuum. There are times where um, there may be a particular lesson or a particular activity that is personalized to a certain extent for some of my students. But I certainly am not living in that far end of the continuum just yet. It's a great goal to have. Um, and I think that the more often I can move toward the right end of the spectrum, the better. But I also understand my own limits as um, a little bit of a novice in all of this and learning through my own experimentation and 
um, trial, just the trial and error, uh, the more that I can offer students choices, the more that I can value their mastery and, and insist upon that mastery before we move on, the more that I can design instruction that meets a variety of different uh, learning styles and learning needs, the, the better I'm doing for kids as individuals. Um, and this is something that I really think is important to see and to understand because when we set a goal for ourselves to um, personalize instruction, it is a huge goal and it certainly will take a long time to progress there. Not just for us as instructors either, but teaching students how to um, have voices and make responsible choices and work at paces that are appropriate and all those sorts of things as well. So I see that as, as being valuable. Um, a few simple things that I probably do on a daily basis, but just pieces of advice that I would offer to anybody who is trying to make some of those first small steps. Um, think about, as I mentioned earlier, how you can make a worksheet manipulative, how you can get kids up out of their seats, moving around the room and talking, and make sure that you teach and model how to do that according to your expectations. And don't be afraid to remediate that skill if necessary. Um, how about having students report their progress to you rather than the other way around? Sometimes asking them, well, how far are you along in this process? Put your name up on the board in the column that matches where you are in the process. What do you need help with next? Or maybe even set up your classroom as a series of workshops that they sign up for based on what they need to do um, and apply that to their, their projects or their learning experiences as well. Um, I do everything I can to eliminate waiting time. Um, so if partners are working together or, I don't know, maybe there's something that they start something collaboratively and then they need to finish it up on their own and one student finishes and the other doesn't and they come to class the next time and they're at different points, I do not allow um, the student to wait for the other one to catch up. So options would be to teach the other one the parts um, that that are missing, so there's reinforcement for the more advanced learner and a little bit of that guidance for the lower one, but also that there are always so many different things going on um, that a student who is, you know, let's say waiting for a collaborative partner can, can make options to go on to other parts of it and then come back to work on that. Um, I think one of the ways that as educators we're really growing is giving kids choices about projects and how they want to prove their understanding and I, I swear every time I assign something um, I'll offer a variety of suggestions and there are always a few that come back with newer suggestions that are so good that I then add them to my repertoire and um, allow others to then utilize that moving forward. And then ultimately, how can you focus on cognitive skills more than content? So how can you teach how to analyze something rather than the content that is being analyzed? So how can we really get kids to do more of the thinking on their own? Um, the next slide that I had on here, I, I'm going to skip because it um, was just a bunch of pictures from my classroom and things that we had done together. Um, but if you access the, the slides, I'm not sure if there's a way to access the slides after this, but you could look through that individually. Um, so just some examples of some of the learning experiences that I've created for my kids. And then um, there's my contact information. So if anybody does have any other questions or uh, would like to learn more about my classroom and my journey, uh, please feel free to reach out. It's it's been a pleasure to spend this evening with you, and I know I talked for a very long time, but um, I really appreciate you all being here tonight, and I hope that you've gotten something that you feel like you can turn around and, and use and change and implement in your own way in your classroom. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, on behalf of iNAPL and everyone in attendance, um, I really appreciate your vulnerability uh, tonight and expressing kind of where you came from and being really honest about 
um, your experiences. It's, it's been incredibly insightful, and everyone is on their own unique journey in this work. And it's really powerful to hear you um, explain your own experiences with that. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we did have one question early on, and we only have one minute left. But if you have any quick thoughts, Rachel, um, Jeff was asking what online instruction tools and sites you use or you might recommend. I know you you mentioned, I think, Edgenuity and Google. Um, but if you have any others, um, we'd be happy to uh, share that with our audience tonight. Sure, yes, my building does do, um, or we do use Edgenuity as our core instructional curriculum. And I, I see Julie's question right now. Yes, our whole school is now transitioned to this style of learning. Although um, at my middle school, fifth through eighth grade, um, the fifth and sixth grade model looks a little bit different just because of, of the age and the independence of our learners. Um, but we all use Edgenuity as our core curriculum. But then teachers do have the ability to supplement anything else um, within there that they feel is appropriate. So um, we do have teachers that are starting now to create their own video instruction. But there's also certainly tools like um, our math department uses Khan Academy, IXL. Um, the English department, we use No Red Ink. Um, I use a program for writing called My Access, which is a great tool to, to really harness the power of um, the revision process. And it allows students to revise an unlimited number of times um, to improve their score. Um, I have used, um, I actually use Newzella quite a bit to vary Lexile levels and still have things about um, a particular topic. Um, as far as other curriculum um, tools, some of our, our staff uses or will build discovery boards through Discovery Ed. And that allows you to pull in a lot of um, information from a variety of sources. But it kind of is a little bit hodgepodge. Um, but I think by nature it has to be like that unless um, a district can afford a, an adaptive program, which is ultimately the goal. Um, Edgenuity is not adaptive. So we kind of help to scaffold the rigor of that by pulling in other things as needed. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we are now at uh, 7.02 according to my clock. So if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us here at iNACOL or reach out to Rachel. Her contact information is on the screen there for you. And again, I just want to extend my sincerest thanks to Rachel for for sharing her wonderful expertise with us tonight. She was certainly being modest in saying that she is a novice in this work because she's doing incredible, incredible work uh, helping students and preparing them every day. So thank you all for attending. Thank you to Rachel. And um, one last plug, we are now accepting proposals to present at our annual conference, which is in October in Nashville. So if you're interested in presenting, we encourage you to submit a proposal. Those are due tomorrow, which is March 16th at 11.59 PM Eastern Time. So uh, you can find more information about that on our website. And we hope to see you at the symposium and on future webinars. So thank you again. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day and great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.